Gather veterans, it's time to join the fight. The long war begins. We are at war. Hoorah! War is what guardsmen pray for. This is The Long War. I'm Rob Baer, and joining me once again are my partners in crime, Kenny Boucher and Wyatt Sir. What's up, guys? Yo, Doc, great to be here. Hey, what's up? Insert something witty here. That was witty. 50, 50% witty. I don't know, I just it kind of uninspired this week a bit, I guess. Hmm. It's been... Well, why don't you, I mean, you have Marvel stuff to talk about later today, so. Let's yeah, make definitely, definitely played some Marvel. Super happy with some of the new characters. You got your Marvel uh, protocol uh, fucking abacus. I mean, there's, they showed off some of the new the new cards and stuff for yep. uh, the Hulkbuster. There's a there's a pretty wild uh, tactics card that's uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, we'll, mm. we'll probably cover some of that tonight if I had to guess, but. Yeah, mini, mini extravaganza happening all weekend over on the uh, Atomic Mass Games Twitch, which is fucking hype. It's, I mean, it's, it's still like a it's, this month is is got stuff going on, you know, like mm-hmm. it's just today, which you know we did before the after hours, we did the after hours, and uh, we kind of came to the conclusion that we're cashing in one of our uh, hobby tokens for a hobby AMA episode. So that's as a table of contents item. That's what our meat and potatoes will be today. Uh, after we go through our news segment <laughs> with Rob and everything, and now followed by a Marvel Marvel Crisis Protocol uh, uh, caboose new section podcast. Making it official. Maybe you just make a new podcast. Caboosey bits. I don't have time for a new podcast. This is Rob in the, in the in the Marvel Crisis Lab, the Danger Room. The Danger Room. Nah, nah there's plenty. Oh, well, that's what you call this segment. We call this segment the Danger Room. Yes, the Danger Room. Yeah, danger solid, room. solid. Thank you, Wyatt. Well, speaking of Wyatt, want to roll out to the Cave of Wonders? Yeah. Would you rather have a three day weekend every work week, or? have a single 40 day long vacation at a time of the year of your choosing. That's the only time off you get. 40 days in a row. Yeah. You have to take it that way. You can't like take two and three here. It's just like your choices. Every work week is a three day weekend, no other time off or a 40 day long vacation each year. Is it a paid vacation? I would assume so. Am I magically paid? Like, because in my situation, like, if I take 40 days off in a row, I'm bankrupt. Yeah. So magically supplemented. But the the another side of that is, like, a three-day weekend means I can't, like, do work on those three days. Mm-hmm. And three-day weekends are not paid by your employer. Like, that's just, like, extra days off. Right? Do you get holiday pay? Is that is that normal? Like, if it's Labor Day and you don't come into I mean, work, do so you get paid for, for that? The- for the purposes of this, like assume that you're you're not going to take like a pay cut or anything for this. It's just like you have to choose how you you want your like time off to be. Huh. So, I mean, a lot of people have that because they got like flex time. So if you work, if you work, but do you have that? Four, this is you. 10 hour days. Well, I, I used to do that when I worked at the shipyard. They would no, have, right now, you Rob Bear, Spiky Bits. You get you get a magically uh, a magic incentive to choose one of these two ways of taking time off. It's you know it's really hard to choose one of those because you're locked in though, right? So you can't like take some other days off you normally yeah. wouldn't take off to go to a tournament. It has to that tournament. I would say to- I would say for most people that work like you know an hourly job or a salary job that's you know Monday through Friday, probably the. Probably the four day one's better, right? Because the forty, the the 40 day. There, no, the forty hours in four days. So you just you basically flex time out. You work ten hours a day, and then you get Friday, Saturday, Sunday off, which is great. But you know, for us, 
Like you got a show on, you got a live show on Friday. I got. Is my three day weekend Monday or Friday? Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm getting magically play. supplemented. Who cares? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'd rather it be Friday. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to wait any lines on Monday because nobody's doing anything. I'll take three day week. I'll take three day weekends. I would like three day weekends. I enjoyed those. Most of the things I like to do in life are on the weekends. Yep. So if it's a, if if I get the three day weekend on a Monday, that just means I don't have to come home after the tournaments over on Sundays. If I get the Friday, Mm -hmm. if I get the three day weekend where it's on Friday, then I don't have to cut out early. And, but it's going to make it hard for Christmas. Acknowledged. Spoiler alert. I don't give a shit about Christmas. I'll go on the three day weekend. Do I still get normal government holidays like everyone else, or is it just like this is my new magic schedule? Yeah, it's your new magic schedule. It kind of makes it even better because now I have this like all amazing excuse. <laughs> That's not bad. Like, sorry guys, you know, I, I, I got monkey pawed on this. You know, I can only be here Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. <laughs> I think the I think the three days off is if you could do that fifty two weeks a year, pretty solid. Yeah, I'll go to every tournament. Mm hmm. Except That's, the big ones. Well, I go to big ones too. It's just that I have to leave after the. the uh, well, I mean, like that's where that's the magic. That's the magic of it, right? My work day doesn't typically start until about noon on Monday. So all I got to do is be back in this seat by noon on Monday and I'm still doing my job. So I'm good to go. But if I get Mondays off too, that just means I have to leave after, just like what I'm doing this next weekend or this for, for Vegas. Mm-hmm. So yeah. My tournament life would be balling. I think it would be a tough choice depending on like what people's job is. Because yeah. some people would be like, I definitely want to, like, if I was still in the army, I'd 100% take three day weekend every fucking, every week. But some people might really enjoy their job or have a more lax work schedule where they might want that huge vacation once a year or something. But I'd be fucked on my tournaments because I can only do tournaments in a 40, 40 day window. Do I get to change the 40 day window yearly or is it locked and loaded once I pick no, it? Yeah, you can change it. It's whenever you want. You just can't do it back to back. Calendar year. Yeah. You can't, uh, can't save them up for a rainy day. <laughs> Tiny dog alert or medium sized dog alert. At the very least. I would take three day weekend, hitting every tournament, all the RTTs. Sure, I'm going to take my lady out, like, also. Cross that bridge when I get it. She'll, she'll probably let me do, like, a bunch of tournaments. I'll be like, well, now you loaded out an excuse, so what are we doing this weekend? Got him. Bad, I would love a 40 day. 40 days in a row? You need a vacation from the vacation. Yeah, it's called work for the other 300 days a year. Rough, dude. I don't know, man. So you have to pick one, Rob. Oh, for me? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's kind of the whole gag of this segment. Uh, That's true, War Pigment. It's 156 days off versus 40 days off. I would do the three... Um, I'd do the three three day weekend. It's, this seems better. Yeah, we can do tournaments together, especially the ones I can drive to. Damn! Since you don't fly, this makes it even harder for you sometimes. <laughs> irrational fear <laughs> of flying. I mean, I'm glad that you can finally admit it's irrational. That's yeah, fine. Thank you, Wyatt. Rob, you want to do some uh, news desk stuff and then slide into your danger room segment? I'd love to. Yeah. So 
I like how he week. like gets a paper and like flips it all out like he's reading a paper. I have to tilt it so I can read it. You're not reading a paper. Do you have this? Is, I'm literally reading this. Oh my god, he actually has a newspaper. Yeah, like an actual. He's, he's always had that. We. I just assumed he just had it as a prop. No. But we don't play around here. This is prof- this is a professional. Did you print that quality. off like earlier? Yeah. Yeah, at some point, yes. Okay, never mind. I'm sorry. Although you could use, I them. always have one of these sheets. Yeah, I just Foster never, you never like showed it to glasses, me. Glasses, so you can like, you can like really put your. <laughs> I, I, I don't have anything that cool. Oh, you want me to age? Oh, I don't have them in here. My reading glasses age me like ten years, easy. That's what I'm saying. More distinguished. I look like I look like Santa Rob. Really? But it's real. Is that whose cat was that? Not, not one of mine. They're revolting. Fucking white over here in the fucking petting zoo. Mine are plotting against me right now. I'm super mad. Uh, so this week from Games Workshop, the orcs will be in store. Not not all the orcs, but just the uh, stuff we talked about last week. The beast nagas, things that were in the army box, uh, the extra war boss, and then the orc battle force. Of course, the normal Kodax, data cards, all, all the things, uh, the battle wagon, and the uh, new terrain piece was actually delayed, unfortunately. So, well, not delayed. They just didn't give it to stores. So those are GW uh, web exclusives. So if you wanted the terrain piece, you're going to have to get order it from GW, unfortunately. But uh, everything else should be in stores this Saturday on shelves ready to go. Also on Saturday, the new pre-orders for some of the Stormcast Eternals and uh, the Oruks, the Cruel Boys, will be going up on pre-order. Uh, the the new chariot for the Stormcast Eternals, and by the way, these are all easy to build kits for both sides, Stormcast and Cruel Boys. Now, the stuff coming out after this might not be, but these they, they basically did the same thing they did with Necrons and, and Space Marines. That first wave that came out after Indominus was push fit. And then everything else after that was like multi-part. Like remember the the ATV was push fit. The yeah. um, turret was push fit. And then like the chaplain was like kind of easier to build. And then they came out with a bunch of stuff. So it's kind of like that this time. So this release is all easy to build. So they got the new Storm Strike Chariot for $45. Uh, the Knight Judicator with Griffhounds. I think he's got two of them. Uh, that's $35. The uh, Breaker Boss on Meyer Brute Trogoth, which they actually previewed some of the rules today for, and they look, he looks kind of spicy. Basically, this is Master Blaster for the uh, the Cruel Boys, and that is Florida $50. What's that? The Florida Man Orcs. Yes. <laughs> Um, the beast Sco- skewer kill bow, which is like that ginormous kind of almost looks like it's mounted in the ground. Um, the, I guess artillery piece is $35. Then you got the battle tones. They're both 50 for the over war clans in the stormcast eternals. And then of course they got war scroll co- cards. Those are both $35 and then all sorts of sets of dice for order, death, chaos, destruction. And then of course, stormcast eternals. And or war clans, those are all thirty-five dollars each. Um, and there's some blood bowl stuff. You probably already know about that if you're into blood bowl, but probably more importantly to talk about real quick is that the white dwarf for September is going to be delayed till October here in the States and also Japan. Um, it's kind of unfortunate because there's slave to darkness rules in there, which actually kind of update the faction a bit to 3.0, kind of like they did with the the Sons of Behemoth. Um the Gargants last month, not a complete overhaul, but something better and something usable competitive rules. Uh, so it's kind of sad that, you know, you won't get it in the States, but I'm sure it'll be posted up everywhere all over. Um, if the, those are really your thing, probably more importantly is the fact that the white dwarf is now $11. Just like $11. Wow. Okay. I have a bottle. No, 20 years. Is that a lot more than it used to be? It was nine dollars uh, last month, so it's basically a twenty-two percent increase in price. I suspect that they are not printing those in America or in Japan, and that's why they're delayed. I don't know. Maybe 
maybe they do it digitally and they have them printed regionally and just, you know, typical COVID delays, like the printing company couldn't get it together and get it out in time in two of the regions. I don't know, but either way, it's kind of makes sense why it's delayed, but it's just, you know, $11 just, I don't know what magazines go for anymore. Like it's, I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Is that like a normal magazine price? What the fuck is it? Yeah. What is a normal magazine price? Like is $11 a lot? I don't know what to think of this. Yeah. I mean, obviously my gut, my gut reaction is dang. That seems like it went up. I feel up like you could buy like yeah. an actual paperback novel for that much money. Yeah, aren't paperback books like eight to ten bucks? Yeah, I'm like some a little. I mean, but I don't know magazines. Someone needs to educate me on magazine costs. Seems expensive, but also disappointing that this price this price increase is like onboarding this delay. Are they getting too white dwarf issues in October, or does it not come out every month? I mean, I guess so. Yeah, it does come out every month. So I guess maybe you'll catch up and there'll be two in America and Japan. I'm not really sure. But either way, I felt we should uh, shout that out because, you know, some people might might not have heard. They said it would be delayed. And then they, now they're like, hey, it's going to be next month. I'm like, Oof. all right. I, then. Uh, I just looked it up. Copy of GQ magazine monthly mm-hmm. six ninety nine. Seems so expensive. it's a little expensive, yeah. Yeah, I mean, especially when they're stocking it. Like I saw it at Walmart the other day. Like, which is good because hey, if that's exposing more people to the hobby, that's great because then you got McFarlane figures back in the toy aisle too, right? So maybe some people that are like, oh, it's Warhammer 40k, start getting into the hobby and such. That's dope. But I mean. I'm not really sure you're going to sell out $11 white tour fit in a Walmart. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Anyways, and another little stealth uh, thing of note in this week's release cycle is that little adorable Nurgling plush doll will be a GW web exclusive only for $19.99. So look for that to also go on pre-order this Saturday uh, if you were smitten by it. I don't think they ever officially announced when it would go up or what its price would even be, but it's on the... Uh, the syndication sheet for stores uh, this week. So very cool stuff coming in the near future. Um, also uh, on the GW side of things, Forge World got a restock on Sunday. I want to say it was I'm not sure if all this stuff sold out by now, but there was a decent, decent amount of things that were restocked. Obviously everybody's, you know, suffering from COVID delays and supply chain issues. So um, just the fact that they're like, Hey, we got a bunch of stuff back in stock is good because it's looking a little sparse over there and it's really hard to kind of make heads or tails about so many things are just like, I don't know if they snap like, Hey, take it offline. Um, because some things are like no longer available, but still up that don't seem to make any sense. But some of the things are like, you know, temporarily out of stock that seem to make more sense. But if you start looking at it as a whole, it, it kind of doesn't have a lot of rhyme or reason in my, my opinion. So I don't know. Um, but, you know, take that for what it's worth. If you're looking for something on Forge World, you know, any of the GW sites always have that, like, email me when it's back in. Um, so you can maybe jump on it. But you got to be quick. <laughs> you got to be quick. Because <laughs> stuff comes in and goes out uh, kind of crazy lately. Uh, then it looks like there might be, might, although it probably is, uh, a new... Uh, Hellbreak model for Black Templars coming out with that release as well. We know there's at least two models because we saw the, the Empress Champion and we also saw the, what is it, the Pyro, Pyrocaster, Pyrocast gun, their new Flamer, but it's also being held by a, uh, like a, it's obviously a Primaris Templar that looks more ornate than just a simple upgrade kit. So potentially there might be a whole Primaris uh, kit Templar in general line. coming out. Hmm? There might be like actual Primaris Templars. Yeah, well, there's definitely Primaris Templars coming out because that is definitely a Primaris Templar. But remember how they used to do like the little um, upgrade screw where it was like. Yeah, uh, I get what you're saying. Like it's this is not that is what you're saying. Yeah, this seems to actually be like it's a whole new weapon, like something we hadn't seen before. So going along with that, there was this uh, snippet of it looked like a, a servitor kind of holding uh, a, a sword and there was a dead orc 
a lot of people are calling it a tactical work because it's a tactical rock thing, but uh, it matches another piece of classic Mark Gibbons artwork, which seems to be the basis of a lot of the new revamped miniatures GW is putting out. I think Fabius Bile had Mark Gibbons artwork. Uh, Mephiston had Mark Gibbons artwork and the poses were very, very similar um, to what we got for models. So, you know, that's kind of cool to see if it really happens because Templars are kind of poised. We know they're getting an army box. So they got to get a bunch of stuff in there. So uh, more and more we see about them, the more excited I think a lot of players are going to be uh, for these new models because they're they're just, you know, they were the the third edition poster boys. And of course, you know, a lot of people are, are very, very much into them. Um, we talked about it briefly on the pregame, but uh, Duncan put out his two thin coats paint line Kickstarter on uh, Tuesday. It's already right now ish eight hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars has been raised for it. The early bird pledges end tomorrow on Friday the tenth. I think about three o'clock ish Eastern, give or take. I forget the exact time, but uh, if you want to get in on that, you can get the complete sixty paint set for I think it's one hundred eighty dollars, three bucks a pot. And there's some other, you know, lots of other stretch goals and stuff. If you do less, it's about four to four bucks. But, you know, as we talked about, it's basically a way for people to uh, support Duncan and the Painting Academy, because unless you just signed up for the service, there really wasn't any other way to do it. So that's uh, it's always cool to see artists getting paid uh, and getting valued for the work here in 2021, because you really couldn't do too much of that, uh, you know, just five years ago or so. Uh, give or take. Another big development in the whole uh, global economy was that uh, the United States Postal Service shut down service to Australia Fucking last crazy. Friday. Um, yeah, it's wacky. That's so crazy. If obviously, if you're you know in Australia and buying stuff from the states, it might be a little bit more difficult because I think the <laughs> The other best alternative is fifty dollars from the postal ser- or from UPS, not the postal service. So, yikes! Um, not sure what any of the you know DHL or anything like that's doing, but it's going to be a little weird for a while. Uh, and then obviously, if stuff's in route to Australia, that it's going to get turned around at the uh, customs clearance and just return to sender, which. I'm going to hold all our packages that come back to us and try to go up to the post office and get them to resend them when the, when the Australia opens back up, because I'm not spending 15 to 20 bucks on postage to have it go to Miami and come back to me. I would have spent five, but I'll be like, all right, cool. Uh, I'll pay you $5 on that. But, uh, but I need another 10, I need a $10 credit here. <laughs> That's just silly. Yeah. Um, and they're not like big on giving us those credits. Well, we're going to, we're going to have a, maybe I'll have to use that voice. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Like, I realized that I have to pay something here, but it's I'm not preposterous. all of this money. Um, yeah, it's pretty wild. Yeah. Um, I was watching something the other day that was talking about how some years ago they created this whole system for emission, like carbon credits. That oh, geez. That's have. such a scam. Um, but I, so I was just educating myself on it. I thought it was interesting, but I was like, I wonder if like they might do something similar with like COVID credits and then have an mm. entire economy of uh, inter sales between, between countries for like COVID credits. Well, yeah, they got to, they got to do something because, you know, it's a lot of things have been delayed um, in general. And now with all this uh, tariffs and stuff, it, it doesn't, it's all very convoluted and, it, and it's, it's almost like it's the nineties again. And it's like, dude, we got the internet, like we're all interconnected. Why is this just not a thing? Um, yeah, it's just, it's just weird. Um, so uh, people are asking in chat, basically they, they shut down the, uh, I guess there's uh, three main incoming clearance offices. I might be saying it wrong in Australia. And they had actually already shut one down. I think the one in Sydney shut down or uh, late August. And then the other two, I guess, shut down because of COVID concerns um, officially in on September 3rd. And then the, 
United States Postal Service just suspended its uh, shipments over there on that day as well. So, um, yeah, that's basically where we're at. No, no word on when it's going to open up again or if there's going to be. Obviously, there's going to be delays. You know, getting everything. I mean, back their intake is already that throttled. Don't even bother yeah. trying to send some shit to UPS. Yeah. Um. So, like, if obviously, if you order anything from Spiky Bits. Uh, or any of our platforms, we're just going to be holding all everybody's orders. Like we'll still send them to you, but not, <laughs> not till everything's open and we'll just hold the ones that come back and pop them back in the mail when we can. But, uh, might, might be a hot minute, might be a week. We don't know. Nobody knows, I guess. Um, it's, it's just kind of crazy out there. So everybody, you know, live your best life, stay as safe as you can, you know, um, crazy. I did want to talk about something else too. Uh, the there are allocations in place for if you're trying to score the uh, the Stormcast or the the or- or Clan stuff this week. I think a majority of stuff's about five. I, I didn't. It's a it's a huge list. And there's no point reading through it all, but there are some allocations. So just be aware of that it might not be as readily available as you want, especially if there's you know at least five of those players in your store. You might you might have to throw down on a pre order. <laughs> it's not going to be like Orcs was this week, where they were like basically thirty or so. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind as you're, uh, Oh, and something else I wanted to mention, uh, about another great artist out there and, and content creator on YouTube, uh, squid Mars metal pewter, pewter metal thunderhawk that he painted up uh, from the nineties sold at an eBay auction for $35,000, which may make it the most expensive model in games workshop history. Nice. Good for him. Hell yeah, man. That's incredible. And you said, so he, he sold it. Was it like just for personal profit or for charity? Oh, no. He said he was keeping the money. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I would, yeah. oh, Doubly good for him. Yeah. 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 I just want to make I sure mean, like good for the charity. Good for him. Good for him. Yeah. That's uh, pretty impressive and amazing. But also what a hype ass promotion. That's it. Get the pewter thunderhawk and I think he got the it the copy came from the original designer, I believe. Which is pretty dope too. I mean he paid for it. Yeah, I remember him having like an interview with the guy who mm-hmm. like designed the Thunderhawk. And I mean he got it, it was like new in box. Yeah. It and it's a it's a dope ass collector's box. I think like, yeah, I watched the video of them like, like assembling it, like it was like the inside. whole team, like, oh right? Dude, I put one of those together in the '90s, and it was it was just ridiculous. It, uh, when I saw he was doing it, I was like, I wonder if he knows how hard that is. Like, I was like, because you had to literally pin in eight each panel like eight times. And it was it's metal and like drilling into metal and you had to like line up the pins with the, the plates on the top. Like it was just uh it's such a such a str- struggle bus, but I think it was dope. It weighed a lot too. I think I weighed it. It was um I wanna say it was six pounds, but I might be off. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, it was it was something else, but yeah, it's a very special piece, and you know, there's not that. I think they've made 200 total. Uh, but man, can't wait to get my plastic uh, thunderhawk. One day, well, we are getting a plastic thunderhawk. It's just going to be for AI. Hmm? I'm gonna buy like five of them bitches. Paint them, them off, take some macro photography. Maybe you'll have, maybe you should buy five of them. You'll have enough parts to make one. Big Thunderhawk. You could like, super combine like, them. Voltron style. Voltron yeah. style Thunderhawk. <laughs> Just like flying around the table, shooting things. All right, guys, we gave it our best. Yeah. Go team, go Tron. <laughs> Rob, uh, you got any Marvel Crisis Protocol shit you want to talk about? So I guess uh, I guess our new segment is going to be what? Dan- Danger Room? Is that it? Mm-hmm. Danger Room. <laughs> we'll go with that. Sure. Uh, so Atomic Mass Games put out some teasers today during their mini stravaganza, which will be going on for, I think, the next three days. Uh, there'll be Legion previews, X-Wing previews, also some Marvel Crisis Protocol previews. 
Uh, today they showed off the uh, panel. Well, they usually call them panel play, but today they just showed off the uh, character cards for uh, the Iron Man Hulkbuster suit. Yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. I like it. He's a he's a chunky boy. So just, um, just to give Kenny uh, context, you start the game with the Hulkbuster, and then when he's dazed, when you you flip the card, instead of him just like going back to work, Tony Stark and the Iron Man armor pops out and is put on the table instead. And then if you get 10 power, you can bring the backup Hulkbuster and the Hulkbuster comes back uh, at full health. But it's, it takes 10 power to do. I'm 100% in on this. <laughs> it's, it's, it, the rule is actually called never leave home without a backup or something. It's, it's, well, you it's used to, cool. he's, didn't they come in from space or whatever? And he sat yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. They also showed off some of the new tactics cards, and one of them I thought was was pretty wild. Which it's one? Called, uh, no, it's called Helios Laser Bombardment. Oh yeah. So yeah. this uh, it, it's the longest range, the range five, longest range in the game, right? It ignores line of sight, it ignores cover, and you add dice to the attack equal to the amount of power spent to play the card. So it's like two dice. It's like real weak. But Tony Stark and any number of allied characters can spend any amount of power they want to into this pool. So on the high end of it, if you have Tony and three other characters and they all have 10 power, that's 42 dice that you're rolling. It also doesn't, this is a tactics card, so it doesn't take up your your action. If it's, you still get if your it's normal like, attacks. Um, no, so one like this actually is an action. Because this isn't a, it doesn't grant you a superpower, it grants you like an attack action. I don't think so. Oh, either way, it's it's a pretty hilarious card. Um, so you can just absolutely delete somebody. And then it has, if you're only wilds, which you probably will, considering the dice that you're throwing, <laughs> um, enemy characters within range two of that target also suffer a damage. Yeah, it's got it's Is it any got damage a for every wild. Splash. No, no, no. So it's it's just one. It's like they all take one damage for being around. The like explosion type stuff in this game is relatively weak. Otherwise, it would get out of control. But it's, yeah, got it's out just, of control and uh, hero clicks for a while. Yeah, yeah. Just, I, the uh, it's it's unaffiliated too. So literally, like anybody can do this. But you have to have Tony Stark on your team, right? Um, it's just it's funny to me that it's any amount of power spent by anybody on the table. So you can have just a preposterous amount of damage. Like you could one shot the Hulk with this. The Hulk's yeah. The Hulk's 20 stamina generally. Yeah. The, uh, so to give you a frame of reference of how this plays, it's very similar to, uh, how, um, Cyclops is, uh, optic blast can work. Like he, uh, if you're doing the, uh, leadership ability for his, his blue X-Men, he can basically pull energy from people around him and then bizarre, like it's pretty rough too. I mean, it's not like unlimited dice rough, but it's a, uh, it's kind of like an eternal dilemma or choice internal debate. If you play X-Men, like whether you take storm leadership or whether you take Cyclops always leadership, take storm, always take storms leadership. I mean, storm's good. She's got movement shenanigans. No, it's the fact that your whole team has cover like all the time. The cover, okay. So I like good. I like that too, but I, so I'm in a game of objectives where you gotta get places and do things, yeah, and and dodge and weave and, and like fan. hold objectives and take them away and run away with them. Like her leadership, it's a two parter. You're right. Both the, both of them are good, but the fact that yeah. like it's cover and move tech compared to Cyclops, like his leadership sucks. I think she's. She's a tremendous value at her cost, which yeah. I think is three threat. She's a, she's a three cost. I mean, I was blown away when I saw she was three threat. And I was like, just hang her out what? with Luke Cage and a Koye for super cheap bodyguard units. Like, and she has stealth. Like, hmm, Storm is real good. Storm is real good, but don't sleep on Cyclops either because he will bazaar you and you don't want none of that for sure. Um, Do you so like roll, other- did you have to like roll a hit in that game? You sort of you you rolled it you, like so you say like okay Cyclops like shoots his laser beam at you here's the attack dice and then you roll defense dice based oh, okay on so not rolling a hit you're rolling a hurt yeah 
And so like you can cancel the damage or you can have you like subtract, like I block two, you rolled five. So the person is going to take three damage. I get it. Cause I was like, I feel like if like I, if my main energy attack came to my eyes, like, I don't think I could miss. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a, yeah, you're right. I get you. I always thought yeah. about that. Like when I say like people miss when they have eye beam attacks, I'm like, unless you're like straight blind, which is not, he is not, we know this. Did you sneeze? Like, <laughs> like, how are you missing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just uh, looking also, at you. <laughs> like, he's, uh, I don't know if he got distracted. The uh, the other big reveal was uh, Ms. Marvel, the n- latest and greatest incarnation of Ms. Marvel, and uh, she's going to be a, a two like a two character thing, like a small and a big version. And there's, cool. um, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's interesting. So there's some tactics cards to where when she transforms, or um, she can be placed, or other characters can be placed near her. And then there's one where she kind of pairs with Captain Marvel, and depending on because Captain Marvel is technically Carol Dan, it, it's a whole thing. She's technically Miss Marvel too from back in the day. And uh, so like, it's like fan club thing. So depending on what attack uh, the um, uh, Captain Marvel does, uh, she does something else and kind of pairs with it. So it's it's kind of, it's it's cool. It's a cool little thing. I don't know how it's going to play on that tabletop, but it's you like- You have literally oh. told me nothing about what she does. So, like, every character has a number of attacks. So, kind of like, imagine, and this is actually not in the game, and it should be, like, the fastball special. Like, if you could play a tactics card, and it's like, oh, if Wolverine's near, oh, well, I guess Wolverine, there isn't a Colossus. Well, we know there's a Colossus coming out. I'm but sure when Colossus comes out. I swear to God, if there's, if there's not, there's we will riot in the street. <laughs> there, will be, there will be riot. Um Say something like, oh, if there's an ally Wolverine within a certain amount of Colossus and he doesn't attack, Wolverine can perform a free, you know, whatever, headbutt or something. Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of like that. It like combos together. Like, for instance, here, I'll just read the card. If Captain Marvel uses the Danvers special superpower, Ms. Marvel may throw an interactive terrain feature or enemy character of size three or less within two. It is thrown small. So it's just like, she's like, oh, you I can do it. that. I can do that, too. That it's is cool. cool. It's fluffy. Um, I'm not sure how it's going to play out on the tabletop, but I mean, Captain, Captain Marvel is pretty strong and she pairs well with uh, War Machine 2 now where they can do the 1-2 activation. So, the um, Air Force? Yeah, Air Force, yep. So plenty of plenty of new stuff on the way. Uh, there's obviously, once again, COVID delays. We're still waiting on Midnight Sun. panels, right? I think so. They're for, that they're going to show off like, I don't know, it's labeled as like talking about the future of mcp and like showing off new stuff so might be some new character reveals and things like that it's kind of they're kind of in the same spot as gw right now like they don't want to show too much because they don't know with all the delays and everything when stuff don't want to blow your hit. content wide yeah yeah but they've got this big kind of build up like they did last year on november because it was their first year anniversary and now they're going to be year two they tend to do like a big faction reveal so mm-hmm. I don't know. It's a tough spot to be in. Do not envy them. But either way, don't sleep on uh, Marvel Crisis Protocol. It's a great game. Um, it's really you know, try cool. it out. But that's all I got. Maybe next week we'll go over like uh, we could talk about like it's what. It's not a weekly we segment. Play. Oh, I, I don't know. I think it is. Rob, do you want to make this a weekly segment? Do not I, call yeah. this into a vote. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> the weekly segment now, two to one. <laughs> <laughs> this is your this is your uh, democracy at work. Uh, we didn't spend that much time on it. It's fine. It is fine. I don't want to make my new hobby my actual work either. Why? Well, because then I got to find another hobby, and it's too hot to work on the yard right now. Your priorities are so weird. No, I, feel I like being. Like, I like having an MCP as like a side hustle. We can just be yeah. hype about. Then why are we talking about it on our work podcast? That, dude, I'm just talking in passing. Are you though? Because I feel like we named this segment and everything, and I think no. there was a corporate vote recently called on this subject. <laughs> no, I don't. Is, is that what happened? Hmm. I don't know. 
<laughs> I'm just saying, I don't like that saying of like, I don't want my hobby to be my job or some shit like that. Cause I'm like, everything I seem to take as seriously as I would take my job, I excel at. And everything I say that excuse about, I do poorly at. In my, that's just like a personal observation in my, in my life. You know, like, yeah, so I just try to like to stop myself from saying that because it's like, and be more honest, like, it's like, oh, you just don't want to put the energy into it that you put into these other things and you're scared that it would be that time consuming. Oh, I, I know what I have time for and I, I want to make sure that the things that I do for other people are the same energy level and the same standard and not you know be yeah, and that's more like the honest else. evaluation so that's that, that's just like side advice it's just like yeah just be honest about it, like that that's self-reflective it's just like not nah, like i don't have the time for it this will be something i enjoy and i will keep that and i will keep it from becoming this but oftentimes if there's something i see and i want to be good at it or i want to like enjoy the fuck out of it i just like mm, this i will take this as i will put my the same degree of focus into it but you gotta be careful with your time right <laughs> so the yard, I like how you use the yard and that you put the yard in there at the end. Like, it's like, is that a hobby for you? I love hobbying on my yard. Gotta, gotta put some time in on it. Is that why happens when you turn 40? You just like, like hobbying on yards or? I just like getting out of the house, man. I don't Me like too, being, but like, you know, I don't like doing like chores when I go outside the house. Well, I mean, you, you got a little different cause you walk your dog, right? So that's a chore. Like, I hate it. What if Rob is like secretly one of those guys that like competes in like hybrid rose gardening competitions? <laughs> I need to he's go got, see like, what the fuck's going on with this guy's yard now. I haven't seen it for a minute. You haven't. It's a uh, it's a pretty uh pretty uh it was out of control. It's been a it's been a four year journey. We're getting we're getting back. We're wrapping. I'm gonna have to make a trip down to fucking North Carolina to take a look at this yard. Take some no, pictures and shit. Let everyone know what we're looking at here. You can take some selfies. Yeah, some you won't with shrubs and shit. He's got proprietary roses growing behind his house. He doesn't want anybody to find out the formula. <laughs> that is not true, although that would be cool. Now he's like, mm, need roses in my garden. Yes, note to self, buy roses. Uh, cultivate some dope roses. All right. <laughs> Someone in chat jump at you. We're getting ready to do a hobby AMA, guys. That's going to be the next segment, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show. So, guys, in chat, throw up some hobby AMA stuff. We're going to be interactive. John Patrick says, adult peer pressure is when your neighbor starts mowing his his lawn, and you have to immediately start mowing yours. Dads get really into that stuff. Yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah. Rob, Rob's like in his 40s now. Some shit like that. You 50, Rob? You're not 50 though, right? I mean, it's hard to say anymore. I mean, like, you're only, you, you're only in, as old in as this cycle of like, like you know, like how like uh, the vampire people in the Twilight show, you know, like they would like go through high school, do that whole thing over and over again. So whoever's like their contemporaries at that time, it's like I'm 17 this time right now. You know, like how do you this time around? Like until we all die and then you have to move somewhere else and do this whole thing again. <laughs> Like, what are you telling the world right now? Because it's getting kind of hard to tell people, like, you know, because, like, when do you move on? Do you move on when it's impossible to convince people, like, that, like, "Ah, I've known you for, like, 25 years, Rob. You have an age. What the fuck is going on? I mean, this, you know, this, this, this fantasy you have is just not, it's not healthy. Look at pictures of Rob from 10 years ago. Look at pictures of me standing exactly right next to him 10 years ago. And you will see I have clearly fucking A's and he has not. That's not my fault. I kind of think it is. <laughs> I don't know, man. I just, I just do my thing. I just do my thing. I just try to move my yard when my neighbor does. Like, I am obviously 10 years older. <laughs> <laughs> Could be my fault, though. It's a, I don't know. It's the gene stealers, I guess. So we're going to do this hobby AMA, but we're going to start it off with a little unsolicited hobby advice. Rob had something he was going into earlier about his new favorite paints, the Army Painter Air paints. And you were going to show the people at home watching something, and I think you were going to grab something. Oh, yeah. So with that epic lead in, I did. um, So these things are pretty cool. They're like triads and they have uh, like a 
a, a shade, a base, and a highlight, right? And the, the things are stupid proof. Like you look at the bottle and it's got a color swatch. Like it's got the three, it's got the three paints listed. And the one that you have in your hand, the you are here, it's it's a color swatch. Like, so it's it's actually colored, so you can't mess it up. Oh, You're yeah. like, okay. I didn't even notice that. Look at mine. This is the paint I have, right? Um, and on the generally it's the it's the mid-tone yeah. is the one that color matches the um this the primer, the spray primers. Yeah, it says it right so, there, 100 percent color match. It's it's, it's endorsed. Yep. And I was like, man, that's that's really crazy that they would match the color primer with the airbrush with the dropper bottle paint. So I actually went through and the, the spray primers I still had that actually worked. I think there was like eight of them. And I did some color swatches. And if you're watching live, you can probably see in the camera that they look the same. Like there's a big spray because I used the primer and then there's a little a little sploosh where I used the, uh, the airbrush and I drew a little arrow to it and I... To some other milk you're watching at home there's like kitty cats unicorns stars <laughs> like swirlies there's definitely a few swirlies but it all color matches which is kind of crazy when you think about it um between those different types of medium making it so uh, so close and so clutch i was like this is dope like i didn't i kind of didn't believe them and i was like i'm gonna try it so i did and i got all the different colors here there's like blue and there's i don't know black I didn't do the white because I don't like work, working with white, so I would have messed that up. Uh, there's a silver, and green, and there's a red around here somewhere too. But um, so those, so they're very, very tight, very, very close. And then I wanted to touch up some of my Custody Jumpy Boys with some quick, bright highlights on their gold. But the, the problem is that the the models are basically painted; they're not finished, but they're good enough. And if you've ever, you know, airbrushed a metal, you know, it just like, poof, like the flake just goes everywhere. Right. So generally you want to do that first and then cut in your, your other colors. Um, if it's just, you know, normal opaques. So I was like, well, let's try it. I can fix a little mess up spot. No big deal. So I, so I mixed up, um, some silver with their gold because it's exactly the same as their normal dropper bottle paint. And I was just like, all right, let's see if this works. And I got in really tight, really close and hit some highlights on just like knee pads and like shoulder pads and stuff that had other painted areas around it, like browns and reds, you know, on the shoulder pads for custodies. And it, it went exactly where it was supposed to go because they got these really tight pigments. It's really fine ground pigments in there and they just didn't explode everywhere. And I was like, this is pretty dope. Like, so far, I've really liked them too. I mean, like they sent me some beta test ones and I like those. They sent me the the mega set. It's like I have all of them and I really like those. And the they have like some color tinted metallics that I think look really nice. It's like the it's like a red one, blue one, green one. Oh like yeah. This really interesting gold. What is one? Uh, I think I I'm supposed to. Oh, they have like a rough iron. It's like a brown oxidized metal. It's really cool. Um, and there was like a golden one, but I may not have it out on the desk. That one, it was interesting. It was like this kind of greenish gold. The tainted gold? Yeah. Is that what it's the called? The new one? Tainted yeah. Gold? Yeah. That mm -hmm. one's like, it looks really interesting. Tain it's kind of cool. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They definitely made up some new colors for this, but they kept some of the traditional ones, including the spray primers. Old man, old mantis house phone. I think I'm saying that right. Mantis toboggan. It says, uh, are the army painter air paints easier to shake up than regular? Yeah, yeah. They're, the, what you're just what you're talking about is definitely like the the older war paints where they were like overly mediumed, and so mm -hmm. like it's almost like no matter how much you shook it, it wasn't fully gonna incorporate, and you would like would squirt it out, and still medium would come out. Yeah, this is not that. This is totally fine. Jeez. And there's agitators in there, too. Double. Say, listen. Sounds like one. Are you no, sure? Two. I'll put it up. Let's see. Just all, yeah, all, yeah. all over my desk. Yeah. No, nah, there's two. <laughs> yeah, and if you do have any of those old Army Painter War Paints in your collection, and that's a big part of your collection, 
and I've mentioned this before in the podcast, and it's not like publicized anywhere or in any literature anywhere, but from the horse's mouth, the what you're supposed to do if that's what that's the version you have is you're not supposed to shake it. You're supposed to squirt it out on your desk until medium stops coming out. Then close it up, then shake it. Because if you shake it first, you're just going to continuously forever keep having too much medium in there. Oh, man. So there's this, there's one paint in there. Kenny, you remember back in the day how like ubiquitous BC Brown was? Yeah. yeah. So like you can't get it anymore. But they have this new one in there called Rawhide Brown. This, this is legit the same as BC Brown. Oh, Beastie so Brown. When, when I discovered this, I was so happy because I was like, oh, man, they haven't made Beastie Brown in so long. Like, how, and how much is the full box? How much is the box for the mega set? Uh, Charles Watts was asking in the chat. I, I might oh, have a sticker, so I don't know. I think they're, I think they're 180. War Paints uh, Air Mega Set is 180, or it might be 160. Let me check. Either way, it is pretty it's close. A, a pretty good value. It's a lot it's of paint. Like 60 paints in there or something. Like I've been giving them out on Twitch. Uh, I've also, just through nostalgia, because I had them, I went back. I'm doing the Emperor, Rob. Oh, I saw that the other night. It and was actually, looking good. Yeah, revisiting like an old school tutorial where we did use the army paints, the greedy gold, the true copper, and the, and the shiny silver. And I'm just kind of revisiting that old uh, work up on him and keeping it as gold as possible. Use some old tech, some new tech. Uh, mm-hmm. It's in my VODs on Twitch, but basically we do like a standard, like kind of Zenith all how you would like do a grayscale workup, but you do it with silver. So that, which is metallic gray. And so... Now, if any of that color information is coming showing through the golds, it's still glittery. Then you build up your golds, you know, true copper and golds. Then you use the ultra red formula, which is in some of my VODs. Then you kind of like re aggressively highlight some areas using silvers. Then you go back in time to the gold and like thinly lay that over those sections. And at that moment, where we like went off the book was a couple drops of uh, transparent yellow for Monument Hobbies. And a couple mm. drops of transparent white. So like yeah, like kind of yellowify it, but like still maintaining a pretty solid, like really shiny gold finish. And we're doing all this, of course, on that totally not the Emperor of Mankind model. But I think we're allowed to say the fucking Emperor of Mankind model, because I don't think there's a model of that guy. There is not. <laughs> uh I mean, I don't know if you know, but there's there's definitely another emperor out there in sci-fi. I feel like there's lots killer. of emperors of mankind in the history of fucking literature. So, yep. so that guy, we're doing him up on Twitch and uh, got the flame and sword. We're doing trying to do some like marble and slash like stone work on them. Try to keep mm-hmm. the the gold kind of like untouched the whole work up, and so we can just minimize our pin washes of it to kind of keep the shiny ass gold luster intact. You try to like refrain from washing all the gold, you know, with the army painter wash. Cause mm-hmm. even though it's the best wash in the game, it would lower my luster and my glitter. So I want to maintain like that as much glitter as possible. So that's kind of like the, the oil wash. So what? Yeah. Use the oil wash. I could, but I don't like the, but oil wash also has a, a notorious filter that you have to look through, you know, like, and so I want no glitter flake to be filtered through to be, to be visible. Oh, so only the depth. So I could use the oil wash, but oil wash is not quite as easy to to stop from going places. So I will just probably use like the army painter, like strong tone or something like that. It just deliberately wash only the filigree oh, that I want. Gotcha. You know, because like that's food. that's one of my things. It's like if I'm going to use a metallic paint and that's the theme, I want like the whole reason you select a metallic paint is because the effect is built into it. Right. Yeah. So I want them. So, so I don't like funny. I don't like lusterless metallics, or I would just do non-metal metallic. I was just using the uh, the AK Extreme metals on this custodian model, kind of like testing out the order. Oh yeah, operations. those things are smash shiny. And uh, yeah, putting the oil wash on there, absolutely zero mm-hmm. loss of luster because the uh, it's an enamel paint. So, mm-hmm. so that's what I was so, saying. It's enamel. Yeah, it's so hydrophobic when you spray mm-hmm. it on there. Like mm-hmm. it literally looks like a piece of. Platinum. Real metal, like yeah. oh. these guys, it's the same. <laughs> yeah. What well, generally when I like, I think you know, I think subconsciously I was I was inspired by your when you did Sanguinius or totally not Sanguinius with those goals. I think that's when I saw the army painter goals and I was like, oh, those are dope. I'm yeah, I think that is the video that got you hooked on greedy gold. Yeah, so that was probably like, 
four or five years ago. And I've been, yeah, because I've been paying those since like 2017 or give or take. Yep. Um, and I think you sent me that Kabuki model that I painted in that video. <laughs> well, might have. Like. The, uh, but I, I kind of did a little different. I did, um, I did a flesh wash, the army painter flesh wash. And I mixed a little, their purple wash in it to give it a little, um, you know, like warm kind of yeah. solid color theory. Uh, I just kind of make shit up. I, I have no color theory experience. Well, if you mix but. purple and brown together, all you did was make sort of like a mahogany brown. Mm -hmm. And purple is a complementary color to yellow. Gold is yellow. So you built in a very desirable uh, shadow that is also appropriate because the brown is going to mm -hmm. link to every color in the spectrum because it is composed of every, co of every color. And you shifted it to a more desirable like pattern. Like that's solid, like a solid move. Yeah. So that, that worked pretty good. That's what I've been doing on everything. And, um, so this box actually is $180. 180 ton of paints. Charles Watts um, asked, not a bad price. I use pro acrylic. Should I pick it up? No. If you already have a pro acrylic set of paints and you're fucking full up and your shit is cat and your shit is all locked in there. No, I kind of like their, I definitely like, Jason's bottles, like with the twist cap and the seal, like there's nothing like it out there, right? And obviously his pigments and everything are always top notch. Um, I think the biggest thing that air paints have going for them versus pro acry acrylic, pro acryl, is that pro acryl are, you know, you got to mix flow and prove where, the, where yeah. these just you go. From if you don't want to, like I literally paint with pro acryl all the time without putting anything in it. Yeah, I mean, I, as much I, as I like these, these but I've also ones. don't because I know why. Like, I don't paint any paints, no matter what they're marketed at, without thinning them down within my airbrush. Um, as much as I like these new Army Painter air paints, mm -hmm. uh, my issue with them is because Army Painter refused to go to straight flow improver for their for their medium for their, for how they cut their for, medium yeah, for the medium in the the, the thinner thing. element of their medium to make it thinner well, without so just to give people like a context with this right you have airbrush thinner which is a uh it dilutes the paint thins it out but it is also a drying accelerant speeds it up so it dries mm -hmm. faster whereas flow improver is a liquid medium that also dilutes the paint makes it thinner but is a drying retardant slows it down right and it flows through the airbrush more smoothly and you can even feel them if you feel them in your hand like you can see that like a flow improver is not as yeah. like watery as a thinner yeah. like it's clearly got body to it still so it's like the in-between step between the medium that the pigment is suspended in and the thinner and so and it's yeah, even it's, in the name like what well, is like thinner is like the thinnest you know mm. so they're they're like medium they have a proprietary medium and it's like a kind of a 50 50 but because that thinner is still there, it does accelerate the dry time. And the thing is like, if we're painting miniatures very basically with the airbrush as if you were doing like a scale model where she's like, I'm gonna make this thing one color and stop, right? It works great for that, it's fine. But when we're trying to do a lot of the more cool factor airbrushing for miniatures, it's a lot of like constant airflow out of the airbrush and then working that trigger very delicately to build these gradients and stuff. What happens with the army painter once they dry on the needle, which causes clogs, that sort of thing. Whereas if you're just using like, even if you're using Vallejo model color, if you put flow improver in there, that's not going to happen because it has that drying slowdown effect from using the flow improver instead of airbrush thinner. It's, it, it's a whole, it's a holdover too, like from the early days of hobby and where people didn't know how to use their airbrushes. And so they were, they were constantly complaining about like the spider webbing or the drippiness or it's getting too wet. And so everyone got it in their head that we need to put like alcohol and things in there. So it dries faster. So this doesn't happen. It's like, no, no, you need to like understand that the airbrush is not an on off switch and just pull it back less. That's the solution. So when you exactly. get to that place yeah. of your airbrush knowledge and your abilities, you start to realize that you want the paint to dry slower and not faster. It's the opposite of what you actually wanted. And so like that was kind of like a holdover. Now we do use thinners and 2D, uh, um, airbrush work all of, often but a lot of times we're using like graphic inks and stuff like that and so most of the ink most ink is just like pigment suspended in it that is it's fine you know you could throw a little water in there to thin it down even more but I, I agree with why like that's my one like I love Army Painter they make some sick ass products they make the best washes in the game 
I do love their paints, and I've done some incredible workouts with them over the years. My Rabute Gilliman that you can see on Instagram, sick ass paint job. That's a hundred percent army painter paints. I have a lot of models that are Hundy P army painter. Um, like sick as hell. It's just that there's yeah. a couple of there's a you know some exceptions. There's airbrush primary airbrush people. I don't like their medium that they put out in the market, their airbrush medium, because exactly what White said, and it happens to also be what is the reason that their paints are airbrush paints. So you're going to be fine nine times out of ten, but when you start trying to get in real tight, start thinning it down more, start to get that real high level yeah. transition game going, that's when you're going to start to see the, the dry tip interaction. But it's not going to be, I mean, that's still not even half the market is going to experience that, in my opinion. Mm. Rob doesn't experience it. You just talked about how you're just raw dogging these fucking custodies <laughs> with, with straight gold mixed with some silver. <laughs> oh, and the army, uh, the new yeah. airs. Yeah, no, they 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 go right out. Um, I did put just a very like a half a drop of flow improver at the bottom first, yeah. and then mix it all together. I I just liked it a little smoother. Um, no paint is out of the pot airbrush ready. No matter what they say, like yeah. it's just not like when I, when it's I unthinkable. Down, it's unpaintable, thick garbage, in my opinion. Like that, like, based on how thin I like to be. I, I still use them. Like I have them on the desk. Like we mm-hmm. talked about. And I still use them, but now I I, I put a flow improver in them because they need it. When I was, you know, beta testing them, I was like, all right, they want this to be out of the box, so that's how I'm going to test it. And some of the colors work better. The darker colors usually they have they must have like a better proprietary mix to them that makes them flow a little bit easier whereas the lighter colors tend to clog really easily because they dry out Mm. so fast um so as i use them now i kind of have to do my own little witch's brew to Mm. get it to work good classic derek and chat says i heard that all 3d printed items are banned by games workshop i guess my question would be for tournaments i Mm. would have to build new sisters army if my heads were printed so there's, there's two answers to this. <laughs> the first answer is at any tournament other than the official Games Workshop Open tournaments, it's totally fine. Hobby your butt off, customize your stuff to your heart's content, yada, yada. It's fine. Um, if you go to the Warhammer Open or at a, I don't even think they run tournaments at any of their retail locations. So that's doesn't matter. But if you go to the Open, They don't want you having third party products and that includes 3D printed stuff. So it just, it depends. Like how important to you is it going to this official Warhammer? What is it? The road, the The road show. show. It's like Warhammer opens, you know, like an open tournament. That's even if they notice that those heads. A lot of times they don't. I can, I can guarantee you a hundred percent that they did not check people's armies because there were pictures of people who actually placed in the top 10 who had Cromlech models, uh, war game exclusive models. Um, there was also an old OG Cyborg Monstrous Minis model um, and other bits. But here's the thing. When you go to these tournaments, unless it's like in your hometown, which is not gonna happen for everybody, you have to pay for airfare or you have mm-hmm. to drive out there, pay for gas, you know. Um, yep. And you have to pay for a hotel fee and you have to pay for the ticket to be in the 40K open, right? Do you feel froggy enough to pony up all that money and go there and hope that nobody catches you? That's kind of the risk. That's the gamble that you're taking, right? So the reason that I am not attending any of the Warhammer opens is that even though 99% of my 40K collections across all five of my armies is Games Workshop Plastic, a lot of it has bits, customization bits, because I want my stuff to be custom and cool and that sort of mm-hmm. thing. But I can't do it because even though I paid them for those armies, like they got paid for their models, they already made that profit off of me. They, I can't use them there. So I just, I'm not never going to go to one. I'm not going to go to Warhammer Open. EMT says, I recently lost access to my airbrush spray can space slash spray can space. Do you have any tips on using a paintbrush to prime models don't don't do that i have a tip but it's so but it's not optimized like definitely figure out like where you could walk outside your fucking house and spray them bitches if you you know like, mm-hmm. whatever but if you're gonna if you have to use a brush and there's no other way you can fucking hobby to prime your models right 
dry brushes. Soft, round, high-level dry brushes or makeup brushes, different sizes. Those are actually really good for primer models. Like, for actually, like, don't use them as a dry brush. Use them as a paint applicator. The soft roundness of them, as it, especially if it's moist and lubricated because it's thick dollops of paint, don't even thin the paint. Just put that bitch down on your palette, raw dog that, that primer on and just spread it out with, you know, with your, you have your three primer brushes, your three, you know, brushes down. You start with the big one, start spreading it out. You have plenty of paint on there. Keep spreading, keep spreading, switch to the medium size, keep spreading, keep spreading, switch to the small one, finish it out. Go back to the big one, maybe wipe some excess off. You actually get a pretty, you can actually get a pretty fucking smooth coat that way. Uh, you will absolutely never get a smooth coat using a chisel tip brush, using a big flat brush, using a standard sable brush. It will always be a disaster. That is your best chance to not have it look like shit is to use like soft round dry brush style brushes. But again, do your best to just like put them bitches in a box or walk like down around the corner and spray them shits. <laughs> yeah, if yeah. you live in an apartment, you don't have a spot. You can always just like go outside somewhere. Yeah. And do it. My old apartment, that's what I used to do. Yeah. So I literally do walked into the side, I've been standing in the sidewalk when, when on Coenga, like spraying my shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, like, getting back to that GW 3D thing too, you can email them if they said, uh, hey, you know, if you They have made know. some exceptions and Rob is right. There's also a loophole that if you designed it, you can use it. So just, mm-hmm. hey, hey, wink, wink, you designed all of those 3D printed heads. Yep, yep. Uh, War Pigment asks, do you, do you use, I like how I spelled use the second time. Do you use Those guys inks ever and if so, how? So it's it's hard to Jason doesn't like me saying this, but it is what it is. I think the Pro Curl transparents are basically inks. They are inks. They he's like, they're not inks, don't call them inks. I'm like if it if it you know walks like an ink and quacks like an ink, it's it's probably an ink. Um so yes. I use those, I use them all the time, and I use them for color filters, meaning I spray them over a pre-existing workup to tint them based on that transparent color. Inks, yeah, so like an ink, when you're discussing an ink, the reason that they are fucking inks is because you've got a pigment, and then you have to put that pigment in something. That's right. where we get our different types of paints that we discuss, like, oh, oil paints, acrylic paints, you know, shit like that. It's like. The pigment is oftentimes the exact same fucking pigment, like where it comes from, like how it's manufactured, how it's made, what it's mined from, whatever. What is it suspended in? What's the delivery system, right? Oftentimes is what we use, is what the label is. In acrylics, they use uh, an acrylic medium as the delivery system, and they're mixed together in a certain way to be good. Now, inks are usually just the pigment with some thinner or some some other liquid that's just designed deliberately to deliver a maximum amount of this raw pigment, which is why they are very raw colors, right? And that's also why you can typically never really find a true CMYK palette or CMY palette in an actual acrylic paint because it's already too much medium dilution has occurred to actually ma- to have maintain that raw form, but an ink, you can get it. So inks are dope, high pigment, thin, out the pot, incredible, thin, super fast because it's not a medium suspension. It's a, it's like a, a thinner suspension. Uh, they can not cool only be, you can do so. What? Th- uh, so another cool thing you can do that I learned of recently is you can get alcohol thinned out, so alcohol based tattoo inks, and use those for painting and airbrushing mm-hmm. because generally those have a much much wider color range to do all sorts of fun stuff with. And you can get them pretty cheap on Amazon. Like mm-hmm. most tattoo inks, unless they're like super duper high end, most of them are relatively cheap because of the amount of you know product turnaround they go through. Yeah, and ink has like, and you can find a lot of like not that like famous brands of ink that are really good too. Because like ink is like not the same thing as like trying to make a curate a perfect oil paint or a fucking perfect acrylic mm-hmm. paint. Like it, so they're dope. So like you can use them to tint things, like Wyatt said. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can use them how I like to use the most because I'll use anything to tint anything. If I'm going to pick an ink to tint something, it's because that righteous pigment is what I what it's called for. But oftentimes, I just use inks to shift things. Like if I got a purple, 
and I want, and it's a dark purple, and I want, and, and I'm like, but I want it to be like more baller, like more jeweled, more gangster looking. Start squirting some like purple ink in that bitch. Just kind of like combine the two, right? If I have like a, I do that all the time with like transparent reds, or like I use like transparent blues and sky blues, right? Or like blue ink in sky blues to make like the most baller, like near cyan you can see. That's how I get a lot of my more saturated paint jobs is because I'm using an ink in the paint. So I'm stealing the body of the paint and kind of over pigmentifying it, you know? So like inks are super handy to have in your workstation and they can be used in many versatile ways. Mm -hmm. Did uh, the, uh, does the new army painter air range have a goblin green equivalent? Yes. Who the fuck said that? Spastica. Get the fuck out of it's here. Ban him called... from our chat. Ban Spastica from our chat. Fucking goblin green troll motherfucker over here with his goblin green questions and his. Will you not uh... be happy until you've ruined every blood angel army in the world? <laughs> oh, is that what he's doing? He's making on yeah. It's style. an inside thing with Kenny's Kenny's channel. Nice. This fucking guy. Um, work back with another good question. What is the most prolific hobby product? 2020, 2021. Mine's really easy. Uh, it's my Any Cubic Mono X 3D printer. It's got to be 3D Oof. printers. That shit rock and rolls. You were using prolific in this in this phrase. It has to be 3D printed printers. But I don't. Is it a hobby supply though? Uh, what do you supply. make with your 3D printer? Hobby items, I guess. Hobbies in the word. It is definitely a hobby fucking item. Yep. I have a lot of students that signed up. Don't even know a thing about Warmer 40K. They're just like, I bought a 3D printer and I'm printing up models. That's what I do. <laughs> like, it's just like, it's got to be 3D printer. Solid. I would say that's what it, yeah, most prolific. There's, there's the legendary. Mike Haspel in the chat says, tell, tell people about Tamaya panel line accent color for pin washing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's a great product. I've been using it for a long time because I used to do scale models, Gundam models and stuff like that functions very similarly to an oil wash, but it's slightly, it's chemically different. And you can put that on your models with a little brush applicator that comes with it and then clean it up with a uh, Q-tip, something like that. It's very, very clean. Very, very surgical if you like that kind of look for your models great product and it's cheap solid technical like it's like a tool right it's like the right tool for the job right like it's designed mm -hmm. to stay where you put it in flow it's okay. like they're gonna charles is like you're gonna paint up hulkbuster yeah 100 charles walks yeah he looks dope oh, yeah, you best I'm, believe I'm, like I'm at least 66 percent of the people in this chat in this podcast are gonna paint that guy yeah if you like MCP stuff, check out my channel. I painted a lot. Uh, something similar to the Hulkbuster that I painted was the uh, Hydra Stomper from the What If series. So I printed this guy out on my Mono X. Beautiful model. Painted him up. Mm. I, I think my pick wouldn't be a 3D printer. It would be an actual... Like for me, something that's more useful when I'm hobbying is... Uh, that vortex mixer to shake up my paints. Now, granted, you don't have to do that with this army painter airs, but those have really been a game changer for me, at least. Okay. Before we get out of here, uh, and since we already have now know that 3d printers are the most prolific thing. And uh, vortex and mixtures. Andy, uh, over on YouTube has a question. Uh, you know, he wants to make some hobby upgrades. What 3D printer would you recommend and or airbrush? Uh, mm -hmm. So there's, so when it comes to 3D printing, there's a little bit of a question you have to ask yourself. And that is like, what do I want to 3D print? So I will almost always recommend resin printers because yep. we want sick models, we want upgrade bits, things like that. If you don't want minis and you want terrain, I would recommend getting a solid, well-reviewed filament printer, FDM mm -hmm. printer, right? Great for terrain and big items. Um, but you don't want uh, FDM for minis because minis are too small and you want that detail. So from, from that part of the flowchart, you go down to what type of minis do you want to print out? Do you want like cool heroes and infantry stuff and like D&D &D characters, a space marine or thereabouts, you know? That kind of thing. Um, I would recommend the Anycubic uh, Photon. 
or the Anycubic Mono, because those are mm-hmm. great for those kinds of projects. If you want to do uh, slightly larger miniatures or batches of miniatures or small to medium sized vehicles, I recommend the Mono X because it has a bigger print head and it's faster. Uh, yeah, size does matter. I know. I've heard that before. Not in the way you're thinking, Kenny. Yeah, I do believe it also matters in the way I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so slow content week yeah oh and also the guy the second part of that question was my airbrush Uh, I think all of us use different airbrushes is that what it is where we're at right now Uh, I think so yeah yeah I'm I'm gonna recommend Badger I like Badger airbrushes they're they're dummy thick super hard to break very simply which Badger though Which, which airbrush if you can only have one uh, the Badger Chrome, it's spelled with a K. Mm. Uh, if you only want the airbrush for detail stuff um, or you don't mind refilling it a lot, um, I use my Badger Sotar 2020 for everything. I use it for priming and everything. It's just you have to refill it a lot because it's a smaller cup. Or you can have two if you want to. I have I have a Chrome and a Sotar. Good. That's a good answer. So in a chat, Old Mantis said uh, Badger 105 for the win. I hate that airbrush. I like. I think the Chrome I is great. I think, the, like I think the 2020 is great. I think the Badger 105 is not great. I used to use one for years when I was doing 2D fucking uh, airbrushing. It was a standard. It was great. The second I started doing miniatures, I was not happy with it. 105 mm-hmm. is too thick. It's too it's too meaty. It's too the thick, tolerances meaty. are just not there to yeah, do. The, like, I mean, it's fine for priming and shit and doing like basic stuff. But like you want to get to yeah. you want to do what like you see White doing and shit. Mm-mm. You're not. You're never gonna be happy. But you can, he's already given you Badger products that work. And Rob, like, what's your jam right now? I'm using the, uh, what is it, Infinity, the H&S. I think it's like, Infinity. It's the one made by Creos? No, it's a Harder Steamback oh, from okay. Harder, G- Germany. Harder Steamback and Infinity. The BMW of airbrushes. It literally is. The BMW of airbrushes. It's like 250 bucks. And obviously you can get better. They have a smaller one. It's called the Ultra. It's like, it used to be 99 bucks before COVID. Now I'm sure it's a little bit more. That one was pretty solid too. I, I would have been fine yeah. with that, but they sent we'll me this, this one. Um, I cannot argue with the quality of brands like Harder Steamback and Pash, Talon. But when I say they are the BMW of airbrushes, I mean it. That also means just like BMWs, you're going to basically have a German over-engineered monstrosity to deal with if anything goes wrong. Just keep that they're, not, they're not that bad. It's been super simple to maintain. As long as you're meticulous and you're into the maintenance of your tool. Because you got to have the right tool for the job. Got to be careful. Yep. Right. Just fair warning. I've had, I've had other people buy into them and be like, this thing has like 87 parts. I mean, if you're, I yeah, so, and that's good because Rob is like showing the other side of the spectrum, right? Like he yeah. is, yeah. he innately enjoys very like well, well-made things. And he is a very good maintainer of those things. Like that's a part of oh, yeah. his lifestyle. I personally would break it or get frustrated with it. I know um, I would lose parts. Mm-hmm. be like, well, I'm a little bit, I'm, I have a problem with object permanency and giving yes. a shit about things, you know? And so uh, but like the, like these are all great airbrushes. Like Badger's an, an, an iconic company. Mm-hmm. Uh, they made a lot of things, right? These are popular airbrushes. Uh, the you know the Chrome and the twenty twenty, uh, hard. You know these are sick. Uh, for a long time, and someone in chat already mentioned it. Crazy Cypress I enjoyed my Awada Eclipse HP mm-hmm. CS solid workhorse brush. A lot of people who are going to jump into the hobby are going to hear about the one hundred five Patriot that Badger airbrush we just yep. shit talked. Um, while also made, reminding you that Badger makes good airbrushes too. Uh, you're going to hear about the Badger 105 and you're going to hear about the Eclipse. Those are probably the t- first two airbrushes you're going to hear about in the hobby community. They're both similarly workhorse airbrushes as advertised, uh, but they're incomparable is a problem. They're similar in price yeah. even, but like strongly urge you, if that's where you're at, those are the two choices that you're hearing about. Definitely right. go like with your boy Crazy Cyber over here. Uh, pick up that something. Eclipse. That I've been realizing, you you may also have realized this through teaching, Kenny, but a lot of something that I realized through having s- different students is that um, the normal airbrush setup, 
right, where you have to use your index finger to work the trigger, um, is actually kind of difficult um, and somewhat unfeasible for a lot of individuals, depending on the like mobility in their hands and the flexibility in their hands. Mm -hmm. So I know that Iwata does make an Eclipse version with a pistol grip and trigger. Yeah, the turn two, mm -hmm. I think is what it's called, or TRN, it looks like turn. Yeah. They make one. So it's, it, I have used it, I, did, I enjoyed it for the brief period of time, it, it worked. It is a little over-engineered again, and I, because of my sensibilities, I broke it. <laughs> but I, I understand like a lot of people have trouble with that. I've seen some people where like they just, they can't work the trigger with their index finger because of issues and yeah. they're trying to use their thumb and it doesn't work right. So. Mm -hmm. Um, they, yeah, if that's the case, mm. and it's it's it's, it's, it's it is it is solid. I know a lot of guys who use that who use that brush, but uh, uh, and the other brush, right? Like some people chat already know. Like uh, I use the Mister. I saw there's there's, company, there's Mister Hobby, they're a famous company. Why it's not about them a lot longer than I have. Uh, they're also a Japanese company, mm -hmm. just like Iwata, and they make an airbrush. And GSI Krios, there's like lolly numbers and shit, and they have multiple versions of it. Um, the one you want though is the PS two eighty nine, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can go see them on Amazon. Be careful. Spray Gunner is a person that we've been, you know, advertising who sells them. They ran out of them, but then they put it back on. But it's not the two eighty nine. But they didn't say anything. Uh, so they're the same airbrush minus my favorite feature, which is the throttler. So that's not the one you want. <laughs> you want the two eighty nine again. If you're looking at Creosis, that brush is a very affordable airbrush, barely a hundred dollars, shockingly good for the investment, incredible tolerances, almost identical to the Eclipse with additional features. These are all these are literally five different airbrushes that we just talked about coming from four different companies. Mm -hmm. Like, they're all viable. So definitely if you're in the market, rewind this shit, hear these things again, and pick the one out that makes sense for you. But uh, if you don't have an airbrush and you're on the fence, get, get a fucking airbrush. Get one of these airbrushes. Yeah, for sure. What are, of are these airbrushes? Don't go get that master's airbrush that you have in your, your fucking wish list on your Amazon account. Do not fucking buy that airbrush. Yeah. The compressor is the 2D is pretty good, too. You want to scoop that up from Spray Gunner. Yeah. Do whatever you want with your compressor. Don't buy the master's yeah, airbrush. Actually, I, I was going to say, like, get a compressor with a tank. Yes. Do not, do not be that guy that gets the nice airbrush and a fucking cake compressor that runs. or a little teeny tiny pocket compressor for airbrushing fingernails. Get a <laughs> solid $90 compressor that'll last you forever with a external tank so that it doesn't overheat. Get a tank. I guarantee it's you. It's funny because like, it. again, I, I have two compressors, neither with a tank. So like, like again, like mileage will vary based on what you're doing. Like I have a three hundred seventy five dollar tankless compressor <laughs> that I love. That's part of it. Yeah. That Mister Hobby makes, and it's one of the sickest compressors I've ever owned, and it is crazy, right? And then I have, but I do also have a uh, uh, the who makes the Air Cobra? What company was that? Was that Mig? Hmm. Mig, like I think Mig put out an airbrush and a compressor. I got their little compressor too. It's it's. It's annoying, but it works. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it makes a lot of noise. I don't like that. Constantly turns on. Pisses me off. But if you're down to spend a billion dollars on a tiny little compressor, Mr. Hobby's got you back. I don't well, know. I got, it's, a, um, <laughs> it's a like nameless brand. The patent for compressor stuff is. Yeah, awesome. that's exactly. The, so it's the. The one I got on Amazon, it's a dual piston with a three, I don't know. It's not gallon. I want to maybe like three liter or something tank, three uh -huh. something, three, three quarts. I don't know. It's like the size of a quart, whatever that is. Um, but yeah, dual piston one is 90 bucks on Amazon and it's lasting me for a good three, four years at this point. Yeah. That's Spoiler really alert, but oh, they're all using the same pattern. So like buy one that has good reviews is why it always says that makes sense for you. That's why the only reason I even brought this little compressor up, this like overly expensive, tiny tankless one, is because it's the only compressor I've ever used in my whole life of doing airbrushing that is different than other compressors. Like it's clearly made differently. Like it is from Japan. The instructions are in Japanese. There's no English. Like it is clearly 
the first compressor I've ever used that is made differently, like different technology. And it's the only tankless compressor I've ever used that is almost, I, I forget it's on because it's so fucking quiet. It, can t- it, it It's actually marketed to be able to run 24 hours continuous without reheating. It's just all fan. It's just all um, like, ra- like radiator vent. Like it's just all yeah. vent. It's a tiny little brick. And it's just on like a rubber suspension uh, cage. So like it doesn't even vibrate as it moves. That sounds dope. And in the back of it is like a gigantic filter that you have to unscrew and clean. Like a huge filter. Not like a little piece of foam and a fucking nipple. <laughs> like it's very, very different. Mm. Uh, manufactured by a completely different country. But I don't know if I would buy another one. Even though it's super awesome. Kind of think I'd just buy a $90 one and just keep it for four years and then buy another $90 one and four years yeah. later and then like I'm in my 12th year of airbrushing before I'm even at like half the cost of this one compressor. <laughs> you know? But you'd have to maintain it. Yeah, and I could just let them just die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but ending on airbrushing. So there we go. That's a trend for us. Like, Airbrushing is a big part of our lives. Uh, I'll do it the right way this time. Rob, do you have any special messages for everyone before we get out of here? <laughs> well, we have a brand new Patreon that you can go and support and get to all the exclusive uh, content and early access videos, including the, as Kenny put it, before the before the after hours. If you can't remember patreon.com, just type in the long word on that. It'll take you to the same place. Also, guys, uh, we're trying to get this Q&A thing started on Patreon. Mm. And Rob is putting these posts out on there so that you guys can do like fill it out and like ask your questions. So then like why it can read them. So far, only one person has asked a question. And he's the one talking right now. He's sus as fuck, so... (laughs) 